Good morning. Welcome back to Grace Bible Fellowship. We're back in the book of Luke again today, looking at some of the things that Jesus did while he walked the earth and the things that he did for us, which is rather amazing. Because as we look at the life of Jesus and the things that he taught us, but also the example that he leaves, it helps us to know how to live. Because it doesn't matter if we fill our minds with the information that we get from the scriptures. It's more that it translates itself into motivation. So the more that we have of that, uh, the better off we'll all be. And I'm sorry to distract you with my orange shirt. I have to get that out of the way before I continue on. I see people whispering and pointing at me, so I have to. Yes, yes, I have a sense of what time of the year it is. I do. I, I know what time it is. Judging me. You judging people, you. Let's... Let's pray and ask the Lord's blessing on this. Father, in our hearts we fall upon our knees before you in humility, knowing that we are just beggars who have received bread, and I pray that you teach us to give it to others. Thank you, Lord, for what you're doing in us and what you will continue to do in us until the day that you come back. We thank you for your unconditional love, for your forgiveness and grace, for all of our shortcomings. And I pray, Lord, that you would help us here today to do what you've called us to do, for me to speak your word in truth and love. And I pray that you'd help all of us to hear your word and to receive it as it is, the words of God, that we might understand that we are your servants. And we have a tremendous privilege to serve you. So, Lord, help us as we look at your word. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, we're in Luke chapter 9, verses 18 to 45, and I'm calling this identity to destiny because Jesus is going to share a bit about who he is, and it's a turn in his ministry right here in Luke 9. He's going from a Galilean ministry to going towards Jerusalem, and he's going to set his face towards Jerusalem, and from then on, that's what his ministry is going to be. It's about looking forward to the cross. It's been about two years that the disciples have been uh, been with him. It's been about three years, actually, um, since he began and was baptized. So we have about six months to the cross. So it's a bit of a countdown. And Jesus now is going to center his attention on looking to going to Jerusalem. He says here in verse 44, let these words sink down into your ears for the son of man is about to be betrayed into the hands of men. I mean, can you imagine being a follower of Jesus Christ and hearing him say that with all of the hype and all of the expectations of who Jesus was and all of the things they've seen him do, raising the dead, uh, healing everyone who came to him. And now he says, you guys need to get this. Let it sink down into your ears. The son of man is heading to Jerusalem. I'm going to be turned over to the priests and the elders and the scribes, and I am going to be crucified, but I will rise again. And he tells them over and over and over, and they don't get it. Kind of like you and me. You hear the same thing over and over, and you just don't get it. So Jesus is centering his attention on Jerusalem as he goes. So just to remind you where you were, this is where we've been. We were in uh, Mark 8, uh, sorry, Luke 8, 22, and we looked at Jesus calming the storm, and the disciples said, what manner of man is this that even the wind and the waves obey him? We saw him go over to the other side to the Gennesaret and there was a man who was demon possessed and he casts legion, a bunch of demons out. They go into the pigs and, and you have deviled ham and pigs fly, you know. So we went over that. I used those jokes. And then we looked at a woman who comes up, this woman who's been bleeding for 12 years in the midst of Jesus going to heal someone else. She sneaks up behind him because she's been bleeding for 12 years and the, the law says that she's unclean. She's not to be in public and anything that she touches or sits upon is unclean. She reaches up and she goes, if only I could grab the tassel or the edge of his garment, I know that I'll be healed. And she does this. And in faith, she takes, she steals a healing from Jesus. And Jesus stops in the middle of being thronged and says, wait, somebody touched me. Peter goes, everybody's touching you. You know, we're all touching each other. And he says, no, I felt the power go out from me. Don't you find it interesting? She snuck up and stole a miracle. 
Apparently, that can be done. But not without God's sovereignty, obviously. And then we see that he goes to Jairus' daughter and raises her from the dead, even though she's dead and they've been given word. Jesus just tells him, have faith, and, she, and he does. So we looked at that. And then last week, we looked at Jesus sending out the 12, and he gave them power and authority to cast out demons and to heal. And they also preached the gospel. So Jesus sent them for two jobs, to preach the kingdom of God and to heal. So as they went out, that's what they did, and they had power and authority to do that. Jesus says, hey, listen, let's, let's go to a deserted place, and let's kind of do a debrief here. We'll talk about it. And so on the way to doing that, the crowds begin to form, and they throng him, and Jesus has compassion on them and begins healing them and helping them, and it's three days that they're all together. And Jesus says, I feel bad for these people. They've been out here for three days with nothing to eat. And uh, the disciples say, send them away. We, we wanted the getaway, you know, by the beach. We wanted to go, you know, the house of fish. That's what we thought we were in for. And, you know, what's going on? It's, it's late in the day. Send them out. And the disciples are always sending them away, sending people away from Jesus, which is terrible. We should never do that, right? We should always be pointing people to Jesus, bringing people to Jesus. And so they're all hungry, and uh, they say, send them away so they can get something to eat. And, and Jesus says, you give them something to eat. And, you know, one accountant gets up with his abacus and figures out how much to get for 5,000 men, which probably was closer to 10,000 people. And he says, you know, even if we spend every penny in the drawer, we're, we, don't, we don't have enough that everyone even gets a bite. And then Andrew finds this boy with a lunch and he hijacks it and says, here, I got some bread and some fish. And the other disciples look at him probably with that cynical look. And he goes, yeah, but what are these among so many? And Jesus says, have them sit down in groups of 50. And so they, they group up in 50s, and Jesus blesses the food. And of course, when you and I bless food, we ask God to bless it. But Jesus blesses the food, because he can do that. And it expands, and it goes, and the miracle is done in the midst of this, and the disciples are handing out food to everyone, and Jesus has touched every piece of food. So I don't know if you're a germaphobe, but I'm sure it was okay as well as the fish, and everyone was glutted. The word is that he, they were glutted, they were filled, they were packed, not another bite. What about dessert? No. Coffee? No. And they collected 12 baskets of leftovers, one basket for every disciple, and Jesus blessed these hungry guys who just went out on a missions trip and came back and they hadn't eaten. They were blessed by giving to others. They were blessed by feeding others, and we talked about that last week. This week, we're going to look at identity and destiny. We're going to take a look at the transfiguration of Jesus. Beginning in verse 18, Jesus says, And it happened as he was alone praying that his disciples joined him. Don't you love it when you get time alone and you can't get left alone? <laughs> Jesus goes aside to pray, as was his habit, and the disciples all kind of huddle up. And usually when they huddle up to pray with Jesus, what are they doing? <laughs> Sleeping. <laughs> Let's huddle up and pray with Jesus. <laughs> if, you have trouble, if you have trouble sleeping, that's the thing. Pray. You go right out. <laughs> he was alone praying, and the disciples joined him, and he asked them, saying, what do the crowd, who do the crowds say that I am? And so they answered and said, John the Baptist, and some say Elijah, and others say one of the old prophets has risen again. And you can see the, the references up there for the other passages where it says this. And it's interesting because that's what Herod was told. You know, who is this Jesus I hear about? And he says the same three things. It's rather interesting. So he must have pulled the crowd, which is what every good politician does, right? Mm -hmm. To make up their own mind. I'm sorry, that was sarcastic. And so Jesus says, who do they say that I am? The crowds. Now, these are the crowds that he just fed. These are the crowds that he broke off all the bread and the fish and everybody ate and the disciples each had their own serving. And Jesus goes away to pray and he says, who do the crowds say that I am? Now, Jesus doesn't have a self-image problem. He doesn't have an insecurity about who he is. He's wondering, what's the word on the street? What are the people saying? They've just been fed a miraculous meal. What, what's on their lips? Well, what's on their lips is... 
He must be John the Baptist, back from the dead, or he's one of the great prophets, or he's Elijah. Now, the Jews were looking for Elijah. It was prophesied that Elijah would come back first before the Lord would come back. And so these guys were always on the look for Elijah, you know, set a chair for him at their, at their feasts. And, you know, Elijah was the man because he was a prophet. And so they said he's one of these three. But, you know, if you ask the crowd today, hey, who's Jesus? What, what will the crowd say? I mean, if you were to ask somebody, hey, who is Jesus? They would say, oh, well, he was, uh, he was a Jew and he grew up and he was a good man and a great teacher and a rabbi and... Uh, they make great claims about him, you know, that he was the son of God and that he died for our sins. But you'll rarely find somebody say that unless they know better, unless they've read the scriptures and put their faith in the Savior. But who do people say that Jesus is? It's interesting when you confront people with the fact of the historical Jesus. They either have to, you know, whisk it away as some kind of a fairy tale, which they would have to take everything that's ever been written and put it away as a fairy tale, or you have to give some credence to this, written by eyewitnesses. And all of them, including his enemies, saying the same thing. This, this is not an ordinary man. So what do the crowds say? It's interesting, the three answers they give, what do these three men have in common? John the Baptist, perhaps one of the prophets, or Elijah. By the way, they're all dead. If you guessed that, you're right, you get a point. I don't, I don't know what you do with it. But so you, these guys, so Jesus, they're assuming, has been resurrected. Isn't that interesting? It's not far to go from there to, hey, he raises from the dead after three days in the tomb, is it? Because they don't know what to make of him. But all three of their guesses say he's resurrected. I just think that's interesting. They would take the most miraculous thing and think that of Jesus. It's not that far. So verse 20, and he said to them, but what do you say that I am? Who do you say that I am? And Peter answered and said, the Christ of God. And he, meaning Jesus, strictly warned and commanded them to tell this to no one, saying, the Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders and chief priests and scribes and be killed and be raised on the third day. Wow. Wow. That's a lot. So Jesus just gives them the truth in a big load, just so that you know, boom. And he also says it a little bit later. He says, let it sink into your ears because you don't, you don't have it. This is what's happening. This is my mission. This is where I'm going. And this is what's going to happen. And he tells them in advance so that they won't be surprised. Aren't you glad that Jesus tells you stuff in advance so you're not surprised? Like in this world, you will have trials. But take heart, I have overcome the world, Jesus says. I love that he gives us a heads up on all this stuff. So he says, who do you say that I am? And Peter comes out with this great statement. And you know, that is the only question that's going to matter when we all die. Who is Jesus? That's the only question. Were you good? Were you a good witch? Were you a bad witch? None of that matters. What matters is, did you know Jesus Christ? And who do you say that he is? And that's the only question that you and I, our whole eternity is based on and the whole rest of the world. It's not whether you're a sinner because I'm a sinner, but I'm going to heaven. How about you? And it's not whether you've sinned and not whether you've done, oh, it's one of those seven deadly sins or, you know, there's none of that. Do you know Jesus as your savior and has he delivered you not only from the guilt of your sin, but also from the power of your sin, so it no longer reigns in your life. And it, do you have a relationship with the king of heaven? That's the bottom line. That's the only thing that matters. What do you say that I am? Matthew gives us a different perspective, and he's going to give us a little bit more. Simon Peter answered and said, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. My wife likes that one because it's more complete. You are the Christ, the son of the living God. Now remember, Matthew is writing from a very distinctly Jewish perspective. And so he's going to make sure that all those details get put in there where Luke is just trying to kind of condense and tell a story for a, a more of a Gentile audience. And Jesus answered and said to him, blessed are you, Simon Barjona or son of Jonah, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my father who is in heaven. 
which means there's nobody who can believe in Jesus unless the Father first draws them. And he says, you know what? Don't think you're all out of a bag of chips, Peter, because if it wasn't for my father, you wouldn't know that. That's the Jersey version, but you guys get it. And he comes out with this great statement. And then, of course, a little bit later on, Mark gives us the backstory. And he spoke this word openly. And Peter took him aside and he began to rebuke him. It's always great when you try to rebuke Jesus. But then he had turned around and he looked at his disciples. He rebuked Peter, saying, get behind me, Satan, for you are not mindful of the things of God, but the things of men. Jesus talked about him being crucified and being given over. And on the third day, he would rise. And Peter takes him aside and says, Lord, come on, cut it out. You can't say this to these guys. May it never be that this happens to you. I, I might be tempted to say that. You know, Lord, come on, cheer up. Get, get you know, a little positive thinking here. And Jesus said, get behind me, Satan. And was he speaking to Peter? We don't wrestle against flesh and blood, but against powers and principalities and, you know, these spiritual forces in high places. That's what we struggle with. And a lot of it's on the inside, isn't it? I mean, I don't know about you, but my worst enemy is right here. You're looking at him. And I have to struggle with all the bad learning I've had, plus my sinful nature, plus what the world's trying to press into me and, and press on my life. And so there are spiritual forces at work, and Jesus sees that and speaks to that spirit of, hey, you can take a shortcut. You don't have to die, which is a temptation, isn't it? Jesus was tempted in all ways, even as we are, and yet without sin. And aren't you glad? Because that makes him a perfect sacrificial lamb for us. So there's this revelation of who Jesus is, and there's this inspiration which kind of strikes the disciples, and then he's going to give them new information. And so you may find, like if you go on a women's retreat or a men's retreat and you get time aside, you're going to get this sort of revelation where you see things in a different way that you never saw them before, which causes inspiration. And then God will give you more information to help you to understand more broadly what he's doing in your life and in mine. So that's, uh, I think it's interesting that Jesus now begins to tell them after all of this has happened, it's almost like, okay, you guys have enough information. You saw the wind and the waves. You saw the 5,000 being fed. You saw the, all, all these guys, these demoniacs and how I took power over that. You were all sent out and were casting out demons and healing and, and all of that. So now we're ready to head towards Jerusalem because I think you guys will be ready. Their faith is rewarded with intimacy and boldness is rewarded by knowledge. It's draw near to the Lord and he will draw near to you. There's this thing that if you're willing to put time aside and read the word and pray to the Lord and have fellowship in his house and use your spiritual gifts and all of these things, that God meets you there. But you can't just kind of sit back and, you know, like you're in an easy chair and say, yeah, God, change the channel for me. I don't like what I'm looking at. And that's that sort of armchair Christianity that this world is propagating. And what that does is it just takes us out from being salt and light like Jesus asked us to be. In verse 20, and he said to them, but who do you say that I am? I'm sorry, I re I'm reading it again. In Matthew 16, 21, from that time, Jesus began to show his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem to suffer many things from the elders, the chief priests and scribes and be killed and be raised on the third day. So Matthew brings out the same point and he says, from this point forward, this is what Jesus is telling the disciples at almost every opportunity. And from now on, as we go through that, you're going to see Jesus is bringing this up all the time and they're just not getting it, right. which is why I read the Bible over and over and over because I just don't get it sometimes. So I have to continue to read. It says here as an example for us, Hebrews 12 verses two and three, looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and has sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. The exhortation in verse 3, for consider him who endured such hostility from sinners against himself, lest you become weary and discouraged in your soul. You want to know what the antidote to depression is? It's right there in verse 3. Consider him who endured such hostility from sinners against himself, lest you become weary and discouraged in your soul. 
You know, when we look at ourselves and we look at our own hardships, we start to think we've got it really bad and maybe God's mad at us and he's punishing us and all. None of those things is true. Jesus suffered. And you know what? The same spirit of God that raised him from the dead lives in you. So can you endure any trial? Yes. Yes. Because you will not be tempted beyond what you are able, but along with the temptation, it will provide a way of escape so that you can stand up under it. We are in the hands of a loving God, and he's not punishing us or trying to trash us. He loves us. He's a good, good father. Amen? Amen. And then he said to them all, if anyone desires to come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross daily, and follow me. For whoever desires to save his life will lose it. But whoever loses his life for my sake will save it. This is this wonderful, one of the many wonderful paradoxes that Jesus introduces. If you want to hold on to this life and the things that this life can afford you, and maybe it's a lot of stuff, maybe it's a lot of emotion, maybe it's a lot of experiences, maybe it's just stuff. You know, that's the problem with stuff. You have to carry stuff. You got to store stuff. You got to take care of stuff. You got to change oil on your stuff. But you know what? From carrying all the stuff and making that a priority, that bogs us down. I mean, you should see my garage. I've got a lot less stuff, but, and it's nice. I don't know about you, but if you ever, if you ever clean out your closet or you clean out your garage, it, what, what a great releasing experience it is to get rid of this stuff, you know, and give it to somebody else. Because, you know, we tend to carry stuff. And Jesus said, if you want to follow me, now if you can imagine trying to follow somebody on foot all the miles that they traveled and saying, oh, okay, Jesus, no problem. I'll follow you, but you've got all this stuff and you want to, you just want to carry it and keep it with you. And if you're like an over preparer, you tend to do everything overboard. Like if you're going for an overnight, you take, you know, four changes of clothes. And, you know, if you, if you're going on a job, you take way more tools than you'll ever need just in case. And that tends to be, you know, more stuff, the better. If we get more stuff, it's better, but it's not better because you got to haul that stuff and store that stuff and carry that stuff. And Jesus says, if you're going to follow me, you got to leave it all behind. In fact, you have to hate your mother and a father and your wife and your brother and your sister, and you have to forsake all to follow Jesus. That's what the scripture says. Now, that's a pretty demanding thing. That's certainly not adding Jesus to the list of things in your life, like some recipe, and you just put a pinch of Jesus in your life and everything's good. Now, Jesus needs to be the most important thing in your life. Amen? Because carrying the stuff, even people, you know, we can put people above the Lord to the place where we serve your mate or you serve your kids or your grandkids. And, you know, they're stinking adorable, the grandkids are. But you know what? It's a good thing they're small because they'd, you know, destroy the whole world if they were bigger. God makes them cute so you won't kill them. <laughs> but if you're going to save your life, you have to lose it, which means that we lay down everything. We lay down everything and we hold it with an open hand. Whether it be a job, whether it be a, a person in your life, whether it be a thing, whether it be an achievement, whatever it is, you got to hold it with an open hand because the Lord might ask for it back at some point in time, right? Mm -hmm. It's when we do this with the stuff, I expect, I deserve, I've earned. It's that kind of thing that gets us in trouble. And the Lord will peel back your fingers one at a time until he gets the thing. And then maybe he'll give it back to you then you'll probably hold it more with an open hand. So Jesus says we have to leave all to follow him. And notice he says, take up your cross daily. This is before he was crucified. Don't you find that interesting? This is before he was crucified. Verse 25. For what profit is it for a man if he gains the whole world and is himself destroyed or lost? For whoever is ashamed of me and my words... Of him, the Son of Man will be ashamed when he comes into his own glory and in his fathers and the holy angels. So what profit is it if you gain the whole world and you lose your soul? Or what will a man give in exchange for his soul? Another uh, gospel writer says. What is the worth of your soul? You know, people don't normally think about that. They don't understand that they're selling out or selling their soul when they make a decision that is contrary to what God would have them do. 
And it's not something that we really think, well, it's this or my soul. We, we hardly look at it in terms that dramatic. And yet, that's what Jesus says. You're going to sell your soul? If you watch The Godfather, or if you've seen The Godfather like many, many, many years ago, it's, it's about what are you willing to do to sell your soul, to keep power, to consolidate power, to secure power. Who are you willing to kill? What are you willing to take? Uh, how are you willing to compromise even on your own selfish kind of motives? And it's a test of wh where do you draw the line and when the heck do you get out and say, I've had enough of this. And when you try, you can't because they pull you back in. It's not that we have trouble with the poor. It says poverty exists not because we cannot feed the poor, but because we cannot satisfy the rich. I found that an interesting quote. It's not in the scriptures anywhere, and it's anonymous, but it's not so much that we can't feed the poor. It's that you can't satisfy the rich. Just a little bit more. That's all I want. Just a little bit more, just enough so I can retire comfortably, a few million dollars, I don't know, own my own island out in the South Pacific, you know. It, but there's never enough. And if, you, and if you have one, then you have to have a thousand of them, you know, and that's the problem. The human soul without having a relationship with God is always going to have a God-shaped hole and always be hungry to be filled. Jim Elliott says this, he is no fool who gives what he cannot keep to gain that which he cannot lose. Brilliant man, well-educated, handsome, young, uh, you know, fairly newly married with a, with a young daughter. And he feels God's call to go and speak to the Alka Indians. And he goes out there with his plane and a couple of his team, and they end up getting killed and eaten. And he felt like, this is what God would have me do. And his life ended very, very quickly. What a short life and a, a short young life. And you think, oh my goodness, what a waste that is. But if you look at all of the missionaries over the years who have put Jesus first and have died early, this statement, I think, applies, and it applies to us as well. He is no fool who gives what he cannot gain, uh, cannot keep, to gain what he cannot lose, which is salvation. You know, I'm going to give my life because I can't keep it. And what do I gain? I gain Christ and I gain eternity. So why wouldn't you make that trade? Hey, I'll take that quarter and I'll give you eternal life. <laughs> That's kind of what it is. I speak in childish terms because I've been spending time with children. But Jesus says that we're to take up our cross daily, which is a daily sacrifice, isn't it? It's something that we have to die to ourselves, all the things that we want to do and all the things that we think we need or would make us better or make us happier. They rarely do. And if they do, it's only for a moment and then it's gone. And then when our life is over, we look back and think of all the wasted time. How many of you have a lot of wasted time in your bed? I wish I had all the hours back I sat in front of the TV. I'd be a younger man. And so Jesus asks us to follow him, not to be ashamed of him. And he says, if you're, not, if you're ashamed of me or my words, then I'll be ashamed of you. Now, I don't know about you, but that's, that's a pretty bad trade right there. I don't want to be ashamed of Jesus. I don't want to be reluctant to share the gospel, something that will mean, mean eternal life for someone if they don't know him. And my goodness, how selfish is that that I don't? or when we don't. Verse 27, but I tell you truly, there are some standing here who shall not taste death until they see the kingdom of God. Now, I don't know about you, but if I was a disciple and I heard Jesus say that, I'd be like, ooh, that's it. He, we're heading to Jerusalem. He's going to sit on a throne. He's going to take the throne of his father, David. It's all going to be good, right? That's what it seems like. But he's talking about crucifixion, and that's why I think they were confused. Because he says things like this, which seems like he's going to go to Jerusalem and take charge. And then he says, I'm going to Jerusalem, I'm going to die. So what in the world is he talking about? There's some that will not taste death until they see the kingdom of God. Well, let's see what he means. Verse 28. Now it came to pass. I like that term. It came to pass. I see somebody flying up on my rearview mirror. Well, they came to pass. There they go. <laughs> Trials and difficulties in your life, they come to pass. I just, I'm sorry, I, I see humor in that. It came to pass about eight days after these things that he took Peter and John and James and he went up to the mountain to pray. Now, it's always those three guys, right? 
there are three events in which he took those three guys, and it may be because they needed special supervision. But he took these three guys whenever it had something to do with death. It's rather interesting. Raising of Jairus' daughter. If you think about it, there are three events and Jesus in, in the garden. He took them a little bit further and took them closer as he struggled with death in the choice. But here he's taking them up onto a mountain. And by the way, this is the mountain. This is Mount Hermon, if you're uh, wondering. It's the highest point in Israel. It's the highest mountain in, in all of Israel. And I, I think it's great. Most of the year, it has snow on it like this. And just to give you an idea where it is, it's up over in here. It's north, it's north of uh, the Sea of Galilee and up in here. So they traveled to this mountain, and now they're going up the mountain, and they're going with Jesus, just these three, and the others are left down below. You can only imagine the jealousy developing between the rest of the disciples and the, the three that he takes closer just seems too much like favoritism. But like I said, maybe they need special supervision. By the way, there's a ski lodge up there now, and uh, they're skiing on top of Mount Hermon, so they've taken this sacred site and turned it into a commercial. Anyway, if you're looking to go far away and go skiing, there's a place. Verse 29, as he prayed, the appearance of his face was altered, and his robe became white and glistening. And behold, two men talked with him and who were Moses and Elijah, who appeared in glory and spoke of his decease. By the way, that's Exodus. That's the word we get Exodus from, which he was about to accomplish at Jerusalem. So here's Jesus talking about his death. And now he's up on the mountain talking about his death. And he's got a couple of consultants. He's got a, he's got a meeting. And he's got the three with him. But as Jesus prayed, they saw these guys there and Jesus began to shine. And they got to see his glory for who he really is. And the disciples were sleeping. Since they went up to pray and all of this was going on and the disciples fell asleep. You ever fall asleep when you're praying? Uh, nobody's admitting. Okay. <laughs> I do. Because, you know, it's always the closed eyes, you know, concentrate, concentrate. and <laughs> What? Start thinking about, you know, what am I having for lunch? And suddenly you're gone. You're doing serious business with the Lord. And it's a spiritual warfare. It's a spiritual development. It takes a lot of discipline. So I'm not faulting the disciples. So when I see them, I don't want them to lay into me. It says that he was like lightning. Uh, Mark and Matthew used some different words to describe it. Or that he was like the sun, or he says that he was brighter than the sun. So this is a supernatural event. This isn't just the sun came out from the clouds and shone on him. Uh, this isn't like most of the artists that you see. Jesus was bright. He was shining to the point where they couldn't look at him. That's a big deal. You remember Jesus said, there are some of you here that will not die without seeing the glory of the kingdom. This is it. This is what he's talking about. But Peter and those with him were heavy with sleep. And when they were fully awake, so you get the idea they woke up in the middle of this thing. It's like, okay, Jesus, let's pray. And they wake up and this is what they see, wondering if they're still dreaming. And they saw his glory and the two men who stood with him. Then it happened. I love that. Then it happened. As they were parting from him, this is the two men, that Peter said to Jesus, Master, it is good for us to be here. Let us make three tabernacles, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah, not knowing what he said. Peter said something because he didn't know what to say. Open mouth, insert foot. He said this because he didn't know what to say. You guys ever do that? You get so excited, you, your mouth just runs off before going through the filter. It's like, did you really say that? It's like Andrew saying, well, we got, you know, we got five loaves and fish. So what's that? You know, sorry I said anything. And yet that's what Jesus used. But in this case, 
It's interesting. He knows who Moses and Elijah are. So I don't think they're name tags. You know, we're going to know things. It says that we will, we, will see, we will see him. We will know even as we are fully known when we get there. And you're going to know who Elijah and Moses are without an introduction, without name tags. So much for lanyards. Staples is going out of business. So he sees these two guys as they wake up and they kind of rub the sleep out of their eyes and they catch what's happening. And Peter, to his feet, decides he's going to talk to Jesus as these guys are leaving so what's Peter trying to do? He's trying to endure the party, right? He's trying to make the party last. No, oh, no, don't go away. Wait, we'll, we'll set up camp here. We'll just stay up here on the mountain, you know? Don't worry about the snow. It's only nine months of the year. He makes this rash statement. It's, I don't know about you, but uh, whenever you go to like a men's retreat or a pastor's conference or a women's retreat or any of those things, and you have this event, it's like you have a mountaintop experience and God just reveals himself so clearly. And, you know, you're brokenhearted. Maybe you cry and, you know, maybe you resolve. There's going to be some changes in my life. And, and then it's over. And you're like, oh, no, 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 don't go home. Let's just stay here. I don't know if you feel that way, but we have fellowship right after this where there's lots of food and uh, fellowship. And, and it's like, oh, oh really, you got to leave? Come on, come on. You know, we, we, we barely put it that in the table. Come on, let's get busy. And that's what he's trying to do. He's trying to prolong it. So he gets the foot and mouth award. Not knowing what he said, he just spoke. At times like these, saying nothing is better than saying anything at all. Uh -huh. Amen? So if you're not sure what to say, say nothing. It, it will, you won't get the, the foot, hand, and mouth disease. In, in verse 27, you remember Jesus said, But I tell you truly, there are some standing here who shall not taste death till they see the kingdom of God. This is what he was referring to. The appearing of Jesus and his glory in, in his glory he had before he had come to the earth. And while he was saying this, a cloud came and overshadowed them. Now you, you have to understand, Peter just gets waken up. These guys are on their way out. Jesus is still shining. And he stands up and he says this crazy thing. Hey, I'm going to, let's, you know, let me get my tools. We'll, we'll build three little outhouses here for you guys and we'll stick around. And suddenly there's a cloud that comes in. That's weird. And a voice came out of the cloud saying, this is my beloved son, hear him. In other words, shut up, Peter, <laughs> and listen to Jesus. It's like God the Father came and interrupted Peter in the middle of his being a bonehead. I would welcome that, by the way. If I ever start saying something stupid, make sure you interrupt me. Stop me from putting my foot in my mouth. This is my beloved son, Hear him. And it's interesting because Peter knew who he was, right? He's, you're the Christ, the son of the living God. He just said that earlier. And yet here he's putting him on par with the guy who represents the law, who is Moses, and the guy who represents the prophets, who's Elijah. And if you think about those two guys, they had kind of a weird death. Elijah had an Uber come pick him up. A heavenly Uber just picked him up and took him out. And Elisha was able to see that. He went in this fiery chariot. And Moses died up on a mountain and the Lord buried him. It's a rather interesting story in how the, the devil and, and the, the, arch angel, uh, the archangel Michael had this fight over the body of Moses. It's a rather interesting thing, but uh, I digress. My beloved son, hear him. And when the voice had ceased, Jesus was found alone. But they kept quiet and they told no one in those days any of the things in which they had seen. So they saw this wild thing. And as this voice comes out, you, you don't see it written here, but they kind of put their face to the ground because that's what you do when God speaks from the sky, right? You just say, I'm so sorry. Forgive me, please. Don't kill me. Don't, don't turn me into vapor, you know? And that's what they do. And then as they recover from that, they look up and there's just Jesus all back to himself. Like, did we just see that? Did that really happen? And it really did happen. Peter explains this in his second epistle in 2 Peter chapter 1, verses 16 to 21. He says to them, For we did not follow cunningly devised fables when we made known to you the power and the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ, but were eyewitnesses of his majesty. 
For we received from God the Father honor and glory, for he received from God the Father honor and glory, when such a voice, such a voice, I could hear that in Yiddish, came to him from the excellent glory. This is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. And we heard his voice, which came from heaven, and we were with him on the holy mountain. And so we have this prophetic word confirmed. By the way, you don't have an experience like Peter, but what you have is a prophetic word confirmed. You've got the true story here. Which you do well to heed as a light that shines in a dark place, much like Jesus was illuminated. Until the day dawns and the morning star rises in your hearts. He's talking about Christ. Knowing this first, that no prophecy of scripture is of any private interpretation. For prophecy never came by the will of man, but holy men of God spoke as they were moved by the Holy Spirit. So the word of God is dependable. Essentially, that's the bottom line of what he's saying. You can trust what I'm telling you because I'm an eyewitness. I didn't make up stories. It's not a fable. It's not a nice allegory or a metaphor. This really happened. And when I told you about Jesus, I wasn't making up a story. That sounds like a trustworthy word, right? Now, it happened on the next day when they had come down from the mountain, which tells you how long it took them to get down, that a great multitude met him. And suddenly a man from the multitude cried out saying, teacher, I implore you, look on my son for he is my only child. It's rather interesting that you have people that have only children that catch Jesus's attention. You remember Jairus? It's his only daughter. You remember the, the widow of Nain's son? It's an only son. You get this only son thing and you get, hmm, what's that all about? Jesus is the only son of the father, right? So he has compassion. My only child. And behold, a spirit seizes him and he suddenly cries out. It convulses him so that he foams at the mouth and it departs from him with great difficulty, bruising him. And so I implored your disciples to cast it out but they could not. This guy's a tattletale on the other disciples. <laughs> While you were gone, I came to your boys and they couldn't do anything. Please have mercy on my son. And so instead of going to one of the disciples, they go right to Jesus. By the way, it's not a bad principle. Go right to Jesus. Don't trust that I can help you. <laughs> it's not that I don't want to be bothered. It's just you can go to before him. We have one mediator between man and God. That's the man, Jesus Christ. So he, he gets this son and he says, I tried to get your disciples to help me, but they couldn't help. Now, remember, they went out and they were casting out demons and healing and preaching the kingdom of God, right? And they were trying to get some time aside at the house of fish and uh, Bethsaida and, and talk about all this and kind of unwind. They haven't gotten to do this yet. And so he says, I came to your disciples. They couldn't do it. Wow, that's sad, right? You would think they would. I don't know. People come to you. Do you know how to point them to Jesus? I hope so. In Matthew 17, 19 to 21, it says, then the disciples came to Jesus privately. So Matthew's giving us kind of the backstory here. And he said, why could we not cast it out? And Jesus said to them, because of your unbelief. Isn't it interesting? It's always what it is. For assuredly, I say to you, if you have faith as a mustard seed, you will say to this mountain, by the way, they just came down the mountain, didn't they? Move from here to there and it will move and nothing will be impossible for you. However, this kind does not go out except by prayer and fasting. Hmm. Doesn't it make you want to go? Hmm. Hmm. So there are certain spirits that don't leave without prayer and fasting. I'll ask you the question, when did Jesus fast? There's no record that he was fasting. It says they went up on the mountain and he was praying, he was with his disciples and he came down and he says, the only way this is going to go out by prayer and fasting. And since the demon went out, Jesus must have been praying and fasting. Gee, so what's, what's the lesson here? Well, the scripture is pretty clear. If you go to Isaiah chapter 58, it explains what real fasting is, in case you were wondering. You know, some of you think it's going keto. That's, that's not fasting. 
<laughs> Isaiah 58, 3 to 11, and I know it's a lot of words, but pl please pay attention. It's important. Why have we fasted, they say, and you have not seen? These are people who fast trying to get God's attention. Why have we afflicted our souls and you take no notice? In fact, in the day of your fast, you find pleasure. You exploit your laborers. Indeed, you fast for strife and debate. You get all hangry. To strike with fists of wickedness. You will not fast as you do this day to make your voice heard on high. Is it a fast that I have chosen? A day for a man to afflict his soul? Is it to bow down his head like a bulrush and spread out sackcloth and ashes? Would you call this a fast and an acceptable day to the Lord? Is this not the fast that I have chosen? To loose the bonds of wickedness, to undo the heavy burdens, to let the oppressed go free, and that you break every yoke. Is it not to share your bread with the hungry and that you bring to your house the poor who are cast out? Then you will see the naked, that you, uh, when you see the naked, to cover them and not hide yourself from your own flesh, that means your own relatives. Then your light shall break forth like the morning. Your healing shall spring forth speedily and your righteousness shall go before you. The glory of the Lord shall be your rear guard and you shall call and the Lord will answer. You shall cry and he will say, here I am. If you take away the yoke from your midst, the pointing of the finger, by the way, that's being judgmental, and speaking wickedness, if you extend your soul to the hungry and satisfy the afflicted soul, then your light shall dawn in the darkness and your darkness shall be as the noonday. The Lord will guide you continually and satisfy your soul in drought and strengthen your bones. And you shall be like a watered garden, and like a spring of water whose waters do not fail. That is what the scripture teaches about a true fast. A true fast is when you're denying yourself and following Christ, which is what he just said earlier. You've got to leave everything to follow me and take up your cross daily. That's essentially what true fasting is. So the disciples asleep up on the mountain were not exercising this. They were not led of the spirit of God to fall asleep during prayer. They were still full of flesh. And that's what gets in the way, isn't it? It's, it's our desires that we give into instead of doing the things that the Lord would have us do. But it's also being concerned about the needs of others. There's, there's nothing about being concerned about your own needs. It's about being concerned with the needs of others. That's what real fasting is. So if you don't eat, well, that's great. You, are you showing off for God? You got something to pat yourself on the back about? Or do you say, Lord, I'm gonna do this. What would you have me do with my time? Or what would you have me do with my finances that would otherwise be spent on food? What would you have me do? Here's a good list. Verse 41, then Jesus answered and said, O faith, faithless and perverse generation, how long will I be with you to bear with you? You get the idea Jesus was a little exasperated? And is he speaking to the people or is he speaking to his disciples? He's speaking to his disciples. Bring your son here. And as he was still coming, the demon threw him down and convulsed him. And Jesus rebuked the unclean spirit, healed the child, and gave him back to his father. And so these guys, although they were sent out and they had power and authority, they weren't able to take power and authority in this case. And he says, the reason is because you're not completely given over and you don't have faith. You're not believing that God can do those things. In the midst of some difficult trials, I don't know about you, but I tend to fall apart. And I know the scriptures pretty well. I, I got a verse or two memorized, and I do that on purpose because I'm a bonehead. But sometimes a situation will trigger me and suddenly I'm all in the flesh. You guys believe me, right? Yes. You've seen it, yeah. It can happen, it can happen just as, and my, sharp, my tongue can be so sharp and I can hurt people without even trying and I just have to continually stay submitted and fast from my flesh. So they didn't exactly do what Jesus would have had them do and he shows this unhappiness with them. He says, how long am I gonna have to be with you guys? Because he's looking to the cross, isn't he? He's looking to Jerusalem. These guys aren't any great example for him and not a real great support for him either. 
In Hebrews 12, 1 and 2, it says, Therefore, we also, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, by the way, it's everything that goes on in chapter 11, which is all of these folks that have gone before us and expressed faith and trusted in the Lord, that we lay aside every weight and the sin which so easily ensnares us. Isn't it interesting? It says that there's one sin that easily ensnares us. And you would think it's customized for all of us, but it's not. It's universal. It's a lack of faith. Whenever it is that we fail, it's because we show a lack of faith. Whether it's depression, whether it's uh, anger uh, expressed in, in sharp words, whether it's some selfish act, it's because we don't have faith. We don't believe that the word of God is what the word of God is. That God's not going to do what he said he's going to do. And it's a lack of faith. So we throw off this weight and the sin that so easily ensnares us. And, we, and let us run the in, with endurance the race that is set before us, looking unto Jesus. By the way, if you look to yourself, you'll be depressed. If you look to Jesus, you'll be inspired. The author and finisher of our faith, by the way, he's the one who builds us up who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross. You know what the joy set before him was? It was you. Despising the shame, and he has sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. See, Jesus did this work, got it done, and now he's sitting down. In other words, he's not busy anymore. It's done. He said it's finished. And they were all amazed at his majesty, as the majesty of God when, when he healed this boy. But since everyone marveled at the things which Jesus did, he said to his disciples while everyone's ooing and eyeing, let these words sink down into your ears. For the Son of Man is about to be betrayed into the hands of men. But they did not understand this saying, and it was hidden from them so that they did not perceive it. And they were afraid to ask him about this saying. You know why they didn't know? Because they didn't ask him. The scripture says they didn't get it, they didn't understand, and nobody had the, the, you know, the courage to say, what are you talking about? Peter gets in and he tries to, like, put his foot in his mouth again. Oh, Lord, may it never be. You know, Peter's always doing that. Why didn't they ask him? You know, if we don't understand something, the Lord will explain it to us. If it's not here in the scriptures, you might find it in counseling or you might find it in prayer. If you don't know something, if there's something that you don't understand, you can find this out by asking Jesus. And I'm not too bold to say that. I have found God to be faithful. He gives me the information that I need. He shows it to me in his word. He shows it to me in prayer or in counsel with other people. Sometimes I'm just, I turn the radio on and boom, there's a lyric and suddenly it just hits me and I'm like, okay, Lord, I get it. I get it. If any of you lacks wisdom, let him ask God who gives to all men liberally without finding fault and it will be given him. That's what the scripture says. If any of you lacks wisdom, let him ask God who gives to everyone liberally. In other words, he didn't say, well, I don't know, you've been kind of a bad boy recently. He gives to all liberally without finding fault and it will be given him. That's James chapter one. Isaiah 53, four and five, speaking of Jesus as a prophecy, surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. Yet we esteemed him stricken, smitten by God and afflicted. But he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement or the punishment for our peace was upon him. And by his stripes, we are healed. Jesus was talking about the greatest event that's going to change the world, which was his crucifixion. And his disciples were no help to him, no comfort to him, no encouragement to him. In fact, they were all afraid to ask him about it. And yet he was going to bear the sins of many. If you have not come before God and confessed that you're a sinner and that you need a savior and you need a life change and a new heart and a new mind, he can do that for you today. That's why Jesus came. He came to take your sins upon himself so that you don't have to bear the punishment or the weight of carrying them. You know what it's like to carry your own sins? We're not designed to do that. There's some really weird and crazy things that happen in our head when we do that. It's called shame. We weren't designed to carry the burden of our sins, Jesus was. And he'll take them away from you if you wish. 
Jesus, keeping the main thing the main thing. I figured that'd be a nice bumper sticker. <laughs> Jesus set his face like flint towards Jerusalem, and he says, I'm going to do this thing. That's not living your life according to your emotions, is it? That's living your life according to a decision that you make before God and you ask God to give you the strength to do it. It's a very different way to live, isn't it? That's what it is to be a Christian. I hope you guys are finding this exciting because I can tell you as I go through and as I search the scriptures and look at this, I'm more and more excited about what Jesus has done and I get a better picture of who he is. I would trust that the Lord does a transfiguration in your life with the information that perhaps you've heard today and that the Lord spoke something to your heart, I would hope that you might take it with you. Make a commitment to him and do what he's asked you to do.